Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Tundra Cast. Today, um, we have a different kind of video. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Um, we're just reacting to some news. It's not, you know, a signing or anything exciting like that. But here's hoping that tomorrow there's going to be some big trades. We've been hearing some big things about the Arizona Coyotes, uh, the Montreal Canadiens, the New York Islanders. But for now, we'll stick to something that is confirmed, which is John Klingberg. The 29-year-old defenseman has ended conversations on a contract negotiation with the Dallas Stars. It is confirmed that he will be leaving um, the team for free agency. Um, and here's to us trying to figure out what exactly is John Klingberg worth? Um, what can you get on the open market? What kind of player is he? Uh, you know, if you're a team that's looking for a defenseman to sign free agency, is John Klingberg someone that would fit on your team? Um, so these are all the kinds of different kinds of questions we're going to try to answer today. He's, these are one of the bigger names that have been confirmed will be testing free agency. We don't know for sure yet if Johnny Goudreau is going to hit free agency or if he can nail down a contract with uh, the Flames. So right now, Klingberg is, is one of the bigger names. Um, so the first thing we have to ask ourselves when we're trying to figure out a player of this kind, which is... You know, John Klingberg is a very good player. What kind of a player is he, right? Let's get an understanding of what kind of player he is. And, you know, courtesy of Jay Fresh, a uh, great, um, great um, analytics um, portal there, by the way. If you guys um, want, you know, a better understanding of hockey from an analytical perspective, um, go to Jay Fresh, subscribe. Um, he's got some great content. So the first thing that you'll notice here is he's very good offensively. Um, and this is really, you know, uh, a, t a tale of, t it's like heckle and jide almost, right? Because he's so incredible offensively. You see that 94% EV offense, but he just doesn't bring a lot um, on the defensive end of the ice. Um, you know, and you can see he's a a very good at generating chances on the power play. He's a very good impact there. So he's a guy who could definitely quarterback a power play. So if you're a team that has a power play that, that just isn't clicking, you need someone to shake it up, and you're being a defenseman who's potentially more dynamic, you know, he's a guy that you can definitely play, um, you can definitely make a run at. Um, he's also very good. You can see his A1 per 60. He's a, he's a primary assist man. So, you know, he's not one of those guys who farms assists by, you know, getting the second assist, right? Because, you know, realistically, people will say all assists count the same, but t typically when your primary assist numbers are higher, it suggests you're more of a play driver um, as relative to someone who perhaps has a more assists that are secondary assists, right? Um, so Klingberg is a very is a primary assist man. He's very good at setting up players directly for goal opportunities and contributions. So in that aspect, he's also a very good player. And his level of competition isn't bad either. Um, and, you know, he he does play relatively sheltered minutes um, for that top four in Dallas, as you'll see later on. Um, but he's still a good player. And it's not like you know he's so bad. Uh, of a player overall that they can't play him, they can't get by with playing him heavy minutes, right? Um, he is playing, you know, his role is a top pair defenseman, as you can see on that Jay Fresh um, slide. So that's just like a quick general look, you know. Now at first glance, what can this guy bring to a team? Um, but we look at, you know, how does he play and, you know, how is he used on Dallas, right? So. On Dal we already know he's not a very good defender, right? And you can see that in the way that they shelter him defensively. Uh, Klingberg, is, as you can see in this circle here, you know, most of his um, deployments are in the offensive zone. It's a very high percentage in almost 60%, which is by far the highest on the team in terms of their defenseman who actually plays significant minutes. Thomas Harley being one of the outliers, being a rookie and not playing as much um, this season compared to the other six guys on this list. Um, you know, he's, and you can look at his micro stats. He's a terrible transitional defender. He's not going to hold up, you know, you know, if you're looking for someone who can defend the rush well, you know, has really good gap control, denies entries at the blue line, John Klingberg is not going to be that kind of player for you. Um, he doesn't play as well, you know, 
um, relative to the other three guys in the top four that much um, compared to um, that much against higher level competition. Like I said, he's no slouch. You know, they're not playing. He's not a bad player. They're not, you know, playing him against the worst, you know, offensive lines of the other teams every night. Um, but he is playing far significantly less in terms of quality of competition than Ryan Suter, Mira Heiskin, and Andy Lindell. So, you know, he's not going to be a shutdown guy. Um, he's a liability defensively. But what he is great at is he's a great transitional passer and playmaker. We've already highlighted this. And Dallas does love to use him in that aspect. You see that 93% carry entries. He loves to carry the puck into the zone. He's very good at pass exits. Um, he's very good at carry exits. So he's He's very good when he has the puck on his stick. He's very good going forward. And he's very good passing the puck. His rush offense, 89%. He is a very good, well-rounded player offensively. Um, there's not a lot of defensemen in the NHL that can do what he does offensively. Um, now, the next thing he asks is, you know, who does he play with, right? Which ties into how does Dallas deploy him. So you'll see that, you know, 39% of... Um, John Klingberg's minutes this season have been played with Issa Lindell. And now you can see why, despite the fact that he's pretty bad defensively, Dallas is okay with playing him against relatively higher level competition um, and not get burned too badly by it. And that's because they have a guy like Issa Lindell who they can play with Klingberg for 40%, almost 40% of the time, who's a rock law defenseman, doesn't really bring you anything offensively, um, but is incredibly solid defensively um, and so he's been the number one guy to play with Klingberg um, and the other guy that plays the second most is Ryan Suter at 29.7 percent now Suter is nowhere close to Lindell this season at least defensively but historically Suter's reputation has been a very good two-way defenseman right so you can kind of see what kind of play player um, John Klingberg is. He's not going to be a guy who, you know, you can say, play him with anybody and he's going to be incredible, right? You're going to have to find the right partner for him. You have to find a guy like an Ace Lindell or a veteran who plays a solid two-way game in order to maximize him. And that's what Dallas tried to do this past season. Um, if you play him with someone that someone else that is like him, who's more offensive minded, you know, you might score a lot of goals, you might get a lot of points, but you're giving up a bunch the other way as well. Um, and he's not a defenseman who can carry, you know, a shoddy defense partner um, because he just can't hold up defensively um, in order to justify playing him in that kind of a role. Um, he's not a two-way defenseman. He's a pure offensive, def offensive defenseman, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, in a league that is very fast-paced, that is very goals-oriented, very offensively focused, you can see why a guy like John Klimberg would have um, a ton of value. Now, the question then becomes, who does he play best with? Now, the number, the the number that we're looking for here, I see, I know there's a lot of numbers here, but the one we're focusing on is on the on the very right, which is the expected goals for percentage, um, which essentially points out, you know, if there's, if you play, you know, a hundred, a hundred shifts, right? We we'll call it. What percentage? Um, if the percentage is above fifty percent, that means more often than not, you will outscore the other team when this player or this pairing is on the ice. If it's under 50%, it means that you will tend to be outscored um, when this pair is on the ice compared to um, when they're off. And as you can see, both pairings that have John Klingberg on them um, with Suter and Issa Lindell do have an expected goal of 4% below 50%, which is not ideal. Um, you can see that their expected goals for is lower than the expected goals against for both cases. And you can see that Asa Lindell with Klingberg is marginally better than, you know, Klingberg and Suter. So, you know, it's not a huge difference, but realistically, you would want to play Klingberg with a guy um, that is more defensive minded to make up um, for um, the lack of defensive prowess on Klingberg's part. Um, and this is where the difference between a guy like John Klingberg and Miro Heiskanen comes into play, right? Miro Heiskanen is making almost like around $8 million a year, and you can see why. Um, it doesn't matter who he plays with. Obviously, he's playing with two good players in Suter and Klingberg, right? But his expected goals for percentage, regardless of who he's playing with, is above 50% by a lot, right? When, Dal when Miro Heiskanen is on the ice, 
Dallas does not get scored on um, as much relative to how much they score on the other team. And that's a good thing. Um, so Klingberg is definitely a flawed player, and most of his value will probably come from the power play um, and, you know, in offensive zone face-offs when, you know, you have established offensive zone possession. Um, but as you can see, there's different levels to this, right? John Klingberg is not mere high skin. And, you know, if he's going to go into free agency demanding seven and a half, eight and a half, nine and a half million dollars, that's likely not going to bode well for him. Um, so now we're going to move on and we're going to look at player comparables, right? And I've kind of like separated into three tiers of contracts. Um, so the first one is Shane Gothis Bear, who signed a long-term contract with Philadelphia a while ago um, when he was pretty young, I think 24, 25 years old. And it was for four and a half million dollars per year. And this season with Arizona, you can see he has striking similarities to John Klingberg. They're both great offensively. They're both power play specialists. They're both pretty good at primary assist contributions. Neither of them can contribute on the penalty kill at all, and both of them are pretty bad defensively. And Gothis Bear was making four and a half, and keep in mind it took Philadelphia a second round and seventh round pick to dump him to Arizona last offseason. Um, so, obviously, Gothis Bear was having a really down season for Philadelphia that year, and honestly, like a bad two-year stretch where they were scratching him, and that's why they had to get rid of him. But this year, Shane Gothis Bear, $4.5 million per year. This is probably like the lower threshold of what a player like Klingberg probably will get and probably deserves. Another example of that is Tyson Berry, who just signed last year a three-year, $4.5 million deal. So, that's like the lower threshold of these guys. These offensive defensemen who don't bring you much defensively but can be a difference maker on the power play will make at the especially at this age, 28, 29 years old, around four and a half million dollars for you know shorter term, three years, four years, right? Now the middle tier is Tory Crew for me. Um, and again, you can see striking similarities, right? Tory Krug is probably nail on the closest player I could find in terms of play style, in terms of play strength as John Klingberg. Good offensively, terrible defensively, great on the power play, primary passer, right? Uh, and he got signed his contract um, last season, right, with St. Louis. I think it was six and a half mil for seven years. Uh, he, he's a guy who, again, is a power play quarterback. He's had a down year actually compared to what he was in Boston. But obviously he's a guy who's been to the playoffs, is a veteran, is well-respected across the league. Uh, and that's probably part of the reason why he got a contract that big. He is a little bit undersized, which might contribute to why his defensive prowess is not as good. Um, and I think this is like the mid-tier, right? Veterans have gone deep playoff runs, which will inflate their value um, and give them more term because, you know, at 29, 30 years old, this is probably their last contract um, and they'll want term on it, right? So this is, this is a pretty good area. And then the last one is Morgan Riley. And I know it says seven and a half million dollars over eight years, which is not nearly as high, um, not big of that big of a jump um, from the six and a half that Toy Krug made. But realistically, Morgan Riley took a hometown discount to stay with Toronto. And if he went on the open market, he probably could have gone north of eight million dollars a year. And so that I think is the upper threshold of what you could get for a pure offensive defense, probably around eight million, right? Um, and Morgan Riley, again, not very good defensively, but unlike Krug, got to spare, and now Klingberg, he does play on the penalty kill, and he's not bad on it, right? Um, and so these are kind of the three different tiers um, of you know what a guy like players like Klingberg historically have gotten in free agency. Um, now, if we go, that's where it comes to, right? What is he worth, and what can he get? So if we're being honest, Klingberg is probably worth, as a player, right, if we're not counting position, we're not looking historically, he's probably worth around five five to six million dollars a year for four or five years, right? That's the kind of player and talent he is, right? Because you can't justify paying him six and a half, seven million dollars when he's so bad defensively. Um, and he'll probably get a no trade clause in this in this case, right? Sixteen team no trade list, right? You know, gives him some security, but also gives the team that's giving him, you know, four or five years the the ability to move him um, if they need to. Um, but if we're being honest, looking at the market, he's likely going to get 
anywhere from six and a half to seven million dollars. He's going to get a six to seven year term and he'll probably have a no move clause or a partial no, no move clause that turns into a no trade clause. Um, and the reality is, you know, uh, he's not going, he's not the number one defenseman on the market right now uh, in, in free agency because that guy is the guy you see on the right there in Tony D'Angelo. And Tony D'Angelo is a guy who could demand Morgan Riley type money, seven and a half, eight million dollars because of his production this season and his age, right? Because he's younger, you can give him a seven year deal and not be too worried that he'll be out of his prime. You give a guy like Klingberg six million dollars, you worry in those last two years of his deal when he's 35, 36, as a guy who's not good defensively, you know, could you be looking at a severely negative value contract, negative asset that you can't move? Um, so yeah, that he's worth around five to six mil. He's probably going to get way more because it is unrestricted free agency and because he's been on deep playoff runs. That's going to inflate his value the way the same way it probably did a little bit with Tory Krug. Now we got to think what teams with that market cap in mind, his value in mind, would be able to afford him, and need him. And he would probably want to go there um, to play. Um, so I've come with three teams. Um, I had a fourth team in mind, um, but I just didn't, and that was New Jersey. But I just don't think they're in the play for another defenseman. They got, they just got off PK Subban's contract. They probably want to invest that money, extra cap space they have, into a real difference maker up front. Um, but the first one that I immediately thought of was the Seattle Kraken because number one they have a ton of cap space and they don't really have any free agents they need to bring back um, and they don't have young prospects they need to worry about giving an extension to outside of Baneers because well they've only drafted for one season now um, but the big thing with uh, Seattle is they've drafted a bunch of they've gotten a bunch of defensive defensemen in their first uh, year of existence uh, in the NHL for their team. They got Jamie Alexiak, who's you know who was Killingberg's teammate um, in Dallas. They got Adam Larson, uh, and they have Carson Susie. These are three guys who have the, over the last couple of years been one of the some of the best defensive defensemen in the NHL. So Klingberg, we talked about how Klingberg is probably best suited playing with a defensive defenseman like he did with S.L. Lindell. You know, Seattle's got three of those guys he can play with. And they can afford him to, to pay him the most because they have so much cap space and not a lot of free agents they have to worry about. The other thing is, he's going to get a lot of ice time. You'll see with these other two teams, because the, the lineups are posted, Klingberg's not going to get top pair minutes um, on, on those two teams. On Seattle, he 100% could, well, would be in the conversation to play first pair minutes. Um, and so from hit that aspect, as a guy who you know probably wants to play top pair minutes, wants to get paid like a top pair defenseman, Seattle would be really good for him. And Seattle needs him because even though Seattle was terrible defensively last year, and you'd go, oh, if you're so bad defensively, why would you sign a defenseman who doesn't play defense? Well, they weren't very good offensively either. Seattle just wasn't very good in general. Um, their, their power play was ranked 29th in the league. And out of 32 teams. So bringing in a guy like um, John Klingberg, who is known to be an impact player on the power play, right? Compared to right now, I think they have Vince Dunn, who's their number one defenseman on the power play. And Vince Dunn's a nice player, but he's not exactly a power play quarterback quarterback the same way that John Klingberg is. So I think from that aspect, Klingberg would be a great signing uh, for Seattle, um, especially if they want to be competitive. And it looked like the intention... Um, during their first off season was that they did want to be good. They wanted to be like Vegas. You know, they weren't going to trade their prospects, but they wanted to be a good team, right? They signed all these guys like Alexiak Larson. They, they selected guys like Jordan Eberle. They signed Philip Grubauer, uh, Jane Schwartz. Like this was a team that wanted to be good. Um, and I think if they're going to continue with that trend um, to try to drive, you know, in fan interest and, you know, a guy like Klingberg could do that. Um, and then another team that I'm looking at, you know, depending on what they do this offseason, could be in the Klingberg sweepstakes, is the Islanders. Um, you know, we really saw how badly the Islanders missed Ryan Pulock when he missed around 30, 40 games, 30 games this season to injury. Um, and Noah Dobson obviously was having a breakout year. 
but from an Islanders team that doesn't really have, doesn't really score a lot, doesn't have a lot going for them offensively, you know, and they've locked a lot of their contracts at the forward position already. They gave Josh Bailey, Anders Lee, Brock Nelson, um, Kyle Paul Mary, the uh, Anthony Pavillier, the big contracts, Matthew Barzell, right? They've already given these guys these big contracts. You're not really going to be able to realistically bring in a goal scoring offensive powerhouse with your current cap situation. Um, because that would just be overkill. You're already investing so much in your forward core. And right now, they only have four defensemen under contract, right? Ajo is not even signed up yet. And, you know, Klingberg could play with a guy like Mayfield, who is also pretty steady, pretty good defensively in that New York on their system. They have 12 million cap space. Ajo and Dobson are their only real free agents. Um, a guy like Varlamov is coming off the books next year, so that's some more cap space. And they can easily move guys like Paul Mary with a second round pick attached to him to clear cap if they need to. So I don't think signing Klingberg would be detrimental to them long term. And um, again, you know, in general, New York just needs to score more, right? And Klingberg has shown that he can be a play driving defenseman who carries the puck, makes progressive passes. Um, and really unlocks a team's offense. And I think especially if they want to keep Matthew Barzell on board, because it really came down to Trotz and Barzell, and the Islanders chose Barzell, and they fired Trotz, which means that they are going to try to lean into a more exciting, offensive kind of um, team. And Klingberg would fit into that mold. Now, this last team here, which is Washington, is a little bit dicey because we don't know this is the situation with Nick Backstrom. If Backstrom and his nine plus million dollars goes to LTIR, I think 100% Washington should consider um, John Klingberg because they are going to be losing Justin Schultz to free agency this year and they need a guy. You know, they have John Carlson, who's obviously a power play quarterback in his own right, but they do need another top four defenseman. I don't I don't think Washington, especially in a wide open metropolitan division, wants to roll out a second pair of Trevor Van Riemsdyk and Nick Jensen. Um, and so if if Basham goes to LTR and they have suddenly an extra nine million to, to work with in cap, I think John Klingberg would be a guy that they'd want to bring in and kind of be that um Justin Schultz replacement on the power play two, maybe even power play one. Um, but if he, even if he is on the power play two, you know he would be very effective with the players there. And on top of that, you know, with with at least with the Islanders and Capitals, because that division is so close, I I don't even know right now who I would rank one to four to make the playoffs out of that division. You know, there's a good chance you could be playing playoff hockey. Um, with the Kraken, I'm not as sure, but with the Kraken, he'd get paid because they have the most cap space and they can afford them and he'd play a lot, right? So those are kind of those the three teams I think are most likely depending on situation. Um, but to wrap it all down, I'm going to come up with a final verdict on who I think is going to sign John Klingberg, how much he's going to get paid, and what his contract structure looks like. And I have gone with the Seattle Kraken. I think it's a perfect fit uh, for John Klingberg. He's probably going to get that long-term security that he wants. He's probably going to get a contract that's very favorable for him because Seattle can afford to pay him and they need a guy like him badly. I think they're going to overpay a little bit for him. I don't know if he gets $7 because I think that's a little bit rich even for me. Um, even for Seattle, but he's going to get something close from them. I think he's going to get an offer that's pretty close. Um, there's going to be a no-move clause for the first half of that contract. He's not going anywhere. Seattle probably doesn't want to move him anywhere in those first three years anyways. That'll take him to 32, where I think he'll then get a 10-team no-trade list on his no-trade clause for the last three years. So from years 33 to 36, um, Seattle will have some flexibility to trade him. Um, so, you know, that's just, you know, my pay, my general breakdown. Uh, you guys let me know in the po comments uh, what you think. Do you think Klingberg made the right decision to not take a contract to stay in Dallas? Do you think he can get more than what I'm predicting? Um, do you think he deserves more? Do you think he deserves less? Uh, let me know in the comments. Um, and as always, like and subscribe <laughs> if you like the content. And we'll see you guys tomorrow for the NHL draft. I'm very excited for that. Until next time, boys. See ya.